Okay, well, thank you all. Um, welcome. My name is Margaret Fisher. I so appreciate you all coming. Um, I know that not everyone on the call actually is uh, necessarily a Quaker or familiar with Quakerism, um, but um, just to explain, um, I'm a member of a gathering, or, or many of us are members of a gathering of local Quaker meetings. And I'm the clerk of our working group on right relationship with animals. And as is the case with all our committees, we were charged by the Quaker gathering to incorporate anti-racism work into our work. So that gave us the idea of inviting someone or more than someone uh, from the Black Vegetarian Society of Maryland to be, a guest, to be guest presenters at a Zoom event. And Naja Wright Brown and Crystal Foreman both very kindly agreed. They've spent a lot of time preparing for this and we are very, very grateful to them. And I think it'll become more clear as evening progresses uh, that there's a surprising amount of intersectionality between the concerns of our working group on right relationship with animals and that of our working group on racism. And that's why we've joined together our two working groups in sponsoring this event. All right. So um, you all could, should have, or probably did see the bios of Naja and Crystal that came in your email. So in brief, Crystal is the owner and educator of Holistic Wellness and Health and is on the board of the Black Vegetarian Society of Maryland. And Naja is the executive director of the society and co-owner of the Land of Kush, a vegan soul bistro in Baltimore. They're going to tell you more about themselves in their talk. So for now, let's just um, settle down into silence. Uh, please put your microphones on mute if they're not already and they can start speaking whenever they're ready. Thank you for having us, Margaret. And thank you uh, for everyone being here for this discussion. It's a very important discussion and uh, I was happy to receive the uh, invite. Uh, I am Nadja Wright Brown. Uh, I am a native New Yorker uh, and uh, I've been in Baltimore for about 15 years. Um, I am not new to healthy food, but I wasn't always vegan, just to give you the background. I come from uh, inner city project uh, in the South Bronx, uh, born and, and raised for uh, 22 years. Um, but my mother wouldn't have me uh, just know the projects. And that's, that's what it was, the projects, the bricks. Uh, she sent me away at six years old for the summers to the Berkshires of Massachusetts, uh, where I learned gardening. I learned uh, about sustainability. I learned about solar pa paneling. Um, the family that I lived with was a, uh, a Jewish husband and a Dutch wife. Uh, and they also um, <laughs> were familiar with the, the Quaker um, uh, practice. Their daughters went to uh, a Quaker school, so I'm familiar with that. And um, my journey basically into veganism was when I got down in Maryland, I thought I was the healthiest uh, thing in the world, eating all this eggs and dairy and cheese and pizza. You know, that New York City pizza is really good uh, with extra cheese and all of that on it. I was, I was really healthy. I was doing my thing <laughs> at age 33. And I got a physical and like, ah, uh, ah, uh, 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 your cholesterol is 249. And if you don't do something about it, guess what? You're going to be on meds. And I'm like, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, I'm holistic. And that's not an option. <laughs> so I had to make a decision really quickly on what I was going to do. Because at 33, being on meds, that is just way too young. And the fact that I was holistic and didn't believe in taking prescription drugs, that was another factor. So I had to find a way to reduce my cholesterol. And this is before before I knew anything about vegan, vegetarian, all these different words that they had out there, I had to figure out how to change my diet. Um, so of course I was uh, gulping down garlic pills, you know how uh, Dr. Google tells you all this stuff. So I was doing all that stuff and drinking skim milk, 2% milk, just anything that would reduce my cholesterol until I met my now husband, Gregory Brown at Verizon Wireless. We worked at the same job. And uh, he was vegan uh, and he was one of the very few vegans that I knew. I'm like, wow, you know, and then a the black vegan at that, like, wow, this black guy is vegan. What is all that? You know, so <laughs> 
he introduced me to the vegan lifestyle and told me about his dream of opening a vegan restaurant in Baltimore. And I said, well, I don't know about anything about food service and I don't know anything about Baltimore, but I used to be a night promoter in New York City and I used to put together talent shows and comedy shows. And, you know, if you're passionate about something, you'll market the heck out of it. So we're now celebrating 10 years at the Landis Kush Vegan Soul Bistro in Baltimore as of January 6th. So here we are today. And um, along that journey, that 10 years, uh, you know, came Vegan Soul Fest, one of the premier vegan festivals in Baltimore. And also came Maryland Vegan Restaurant Week, which we've been celebrating uh, for a couple of years now. And we'll be on our eighth edition starting next month. Uh, Naja Speaks, all this stuff. So um, that's pretty much my background in a nutshell. And I welcome questions after the presentation. <laughs> there you go, Crystal. Happy greetings, everyone. So I am Crystal Foreman. In addition to being an owner and educator of holistic wellness and health and on the board of the Black Vegetarian Society of Maryland, I'm also on the board of the Baltimore City Master Gardeners. Um, I use a holistic approach um, in everything I do. So I look at mind, body, and spirit when talking about food, um, the environment, and um, how we interact with each other as well. And so I mostly show people how to make plant-based meals easy, nutritious, delicious, and fun. And I do um, live cooking demos on Facebook and YouTube every Monday and Friday. So usually Friday, I'm showing people how to use produce from the produce boxes, the CSA um, boxes that they might not be familiar with and showing them how to use, like right now, roots are very popular in the boxes and a lot of people have no idea what to do with them or like butternut squash or acorn squash. So just showing people how it can be easy, um, whether it's time or affordability, but all of that, that is accessible. Um, so that's my main thing. But then I also teach people veganic gardening. And so I work with a local farm in Baltimore City, um, specifically working with the youth and teaching them how to grow, um, preserve food and harvest food as well as cooking food. So going through the whole cycle, we're learning about soil health and um, composting and all of those things as well. And I'm also a food safety educator trainee um, for farms. So part of um, what we're doing um, as an organization is going to different farms in Maryland, Pennsylvania, um, and Virginia, and I think Delaware is added in there. But um, yeah, going to all of these farms and for free, um, it's a free resource to the farms and teaching them how to have um, safe food practices and to help them get GAP certified, which is good agricultural practices. Um, so yeah, I've been vegan for 10 years. Um, before that, I've been um, vegetarian on and off uh, since I was a kid. So a lot of it for me as a young, when I was younger was thinking about where the animal, like the, about animals and where my food came from and reading the ingredients on Scrapple and reading the ingredients on everything. And, um, and I had like a, a, it's more of a soul feeling. Like I, if I felt um, something when I thought about eating animals. And so I, my parents were very understanding. Um, and so they didn't force me to eat anything I didn't want to eat. And they were, um, really good about getting different things. So my mom was always exposed to different things anyway. She has cousins who are um, plant-based and who would um, promote it to her a lot. So she knew um, a lot of different options for me. And um, for me, like the final decision of like not going back was thinking about like the thinking about food and what food is and what food is to me. And so once I made the decision for myself that certain things were not for me to consume it made it easier for me to it doesn't feel like i'm taking like something's taken away from me like oh i can't have i eat so much variety now than way more than i ever did before and um i think it's opened my eyes to a lot of things as well so for me i'm vegan um plant-based vegan because there are um, vegans who are not healthy <laughs> um, who don't fo follow necessarily plant-based but i am um plant-based ethical vegan and so I do it for the environment um, as well as for animals and for the people as well, because I understand that our food system um, has a lot of injustices to the people in the food system and not just the animals. So those are all of the reasons um, why I am plant-based vegan. 
And I wanted to add before we get into the presentation and start talking about um, the Black Vegetarian Society of Maryland, the way Crystal and I connected, um, you know, and I don't know every little detail. I know uh, she was at, uh, she was working with one of our board members, Willie Flowers at um, Park Heights uh, Community Health Alliance. And she was doing a lot of work with him. And that's kind of how I connected with her. And she invited me uh, to a TEDx talk. They were doing a talk about women in Baltimore and, you know, you know what their journeys and, and, you know, all this great stuff. And that made our connection. So when the Black Vegetarian Society came about, this wasn't a new organization. This was a Facebook page that one of our customers at the Land of Kush kept trying to hand over to me and my husband when we opened up the restaurant. And it was just really too soon for us to take something like this on because mind you, restaurants are the hardest business to own and operate in that first three years is critical. So after we were over that trial period, you know, he continued to come to us and say, hey, look at what you've done with this restaurant. I know you can take this on and you can and, and you can grow with this. We adopted the, the Facebook page and then made it an official 501c3. And then I sought out those individuals that I felt would be the best uh, collective members and, and that would take the organization where it needed to go. And that's how Crystal and I and uh, the rest of us connected. So are we ready for the presentation? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Just give me a nod if you can see it. All right, awesome. Okay, so Crystal and I have introduced ourselves. And okay, there you go. Okay. Mm -hmm. So today we're going to discuss um, this, that topics here. Um, we basically decided to um, make the discussion based on a lot of the questions that came in. So you'll see some of your questions on here. Um, so what is the Black Vegetarian Society of Maryland and who our team is and why we're effective in the community? What is anti-racism, food colonialism, and food apartheid? What is the interconnectedness of social justice movements and food colonialism? And what represents the vegan movement in African-American culture? What's the connection between climate justice, climate change, and food? And how does one adopt a plant-based diet? What is good food, essential herbs, and spices? And how to ensure our ability to elect our representative government? And how can farmers thrive on their land without using animals? And what is effective outreach? And then we'll end with questions and answers. Thank you, Crystal. So the Black Vegetarian Society's mission is to educate the public. So, you know, we're, we're welcoming to all, but we understand we particularly need to focus on African-American and Latinx communities. Why? Because of the health disparities and because of the lack of information uh, and, and their ability to assess some of this information and because we need to represent we need to be the representatives of delivering this this information to our communities because I think we're best fit to do that. Um, we know them, we know the cultures, and it's easier for us to navigate through it. So we're educating them on the benefits of a plant-based, a pure vegetarian diet, because pure vegetarian is still a thing. I don't know what eggs and dairy have to do with vegetarian, but that's a whole nother talk and, and other research. Um, so we focus on building community around healthy, accessible, and sustainable food, as uh, Crystal mentioned, and a focus on lifestyle choices, and of course, those lifestyle choices being compassionate choices. We are a 24-7 online resource center with referrals and health and wellness coaches. We host special events, webinars, cooking demos, and wellness classes. And when I say 24-7, um, Margaret, you reached out to us. It probably was in the middle of my, I forgot what time. You can email us and we can be there for you. We are connectors. So we will do our best to get you connected to whoever you need to, to, to be connected to, um, whether it's us or we're not the best fit, we can get you connected. So 24 seven online resource. If you don't want to talk to us, you can go on there. We have all type of information. We're not recreating the wheel. We are working with partners that have access to wealth of information about this lifestyle. This is our team. 
myself, Nadja Wright Brown, I'm the executive director. Uh, Gregory Brown is my husband. Um, he's also uh, the head chef of the Land of Kush, and he's a phenomenal, phenomenal cook. Uh, Crystal Foreman, uh, who we have here, Antoinette Tony St. Clair Fish, does great jobs on uh, webinars that you can find on our website uh, under the blog se section. And Willie Flowers is our director. He's also the president of the Maryland uh, State NAACP Conference and the executive director of the, the Park Heights Community Health Alliance. So why are we as an organization effective? So um, our slogan is meeting you where you are. And so we take a non-judgmental approach to going to different communities and actually going out and doing the research or do, doing the um, outreach to the communities. Um, right now, everything's online. And so we're making our outreach um, to a lot of campaigns online as well. We welcome everyone, whether they're omnivores, reducitarian, flexitarian, vegetarian, um, just like food, <laughs> whatever it is, um, they are welcome. Everyone is welcome. We are culturally diverse. A lot of our volunteers um, come from all over the world. We have um, different ethnicities um, represented within our organization. And um, same thing with socioeconomic and professional status within our organization, as well as the communities we reach. So whether um, someone makes four figures or seven figures or whatever. We don't care. Um, our goal is to make sure that you have the information that you need to um, make the right decisions for you and your family. So, what is anti-racism, food colonialism, and food apartheid? So anti-racism is a belief or practice that recognizes pervasive racism in society and actively combats racial prejudice and discrimination in order to promote racial justice and equality. And so it's important that we recognize the difference between racism, someone saying they're not racist and anti-racism. And so there are different types of racism out there. Um, the National Museum of African-American Culture and um, History and Culture um, has a great um, article on the different types of racism and I'll link that at the end as a resource. But um, there's individual racism, which is more like someone feeling superior and or like feel like they don't want to hire someone because of the way they look. Um, there's interpersonal um, racism, which is usually where someone might use um, slurs or make statements. Um, institutional racism, um, some things we think about are schools and prison systems. And then structural um, racism, which is more like stereotypes. And that's what's really embedded in our society and something that it's just in the fabric of you know, what we experience, whether we realize it or not, whether we're watching commercials, watching television, it's a lot of um, messages that are out there that are, will be considered racist. Now, a lot of people think of racist like, oh, I'm not racist, I don't hate anyone. But there's a lot of um, different mindsets with, with that, that all of us have been exposed to. Um, a lot of people say, oh, I can't be racist because I have um, a black child or you know, I have a Hispanic friend or whatever that is. And um, there's a difference in saying like not being racist um, and saying that, because even a white, white national will say they're not racist. And so that, that, that term, means different things, first of all, to different people. And so it's important that we take away that and say not racist, because a lot of people will say they're not racist um, because they don't hate another, another group, but they might have a bias against another group and not even necessarily realize it. Um, and they don't mean any harm, but the actions they take can still produce harm. So when we say anti-racist, we're thinking more about um, you know, thinking that groups are equal making sure that um, policies are equal, that making sure that um, people have access to the money and access to power, basically equitably. And it's not just certain groups that get those powers. And so um, there's an excellent book that came out a couple of years ago um, by Ibram Kendi called How to Be an Anti-Racist. And so if you um, do a, just a search on YouTube, he has a lot of talks <laughs> just on that topic of anti-racism. And so it's very important um, that we think about what that means. Um, and not like some 
someone did ask the question, um, can they love their neighbor if they're being anti-racist? And so that term anti isn't like against, like in a negative way, it's against um, a system. And so it's not against a person and saying, I don't like this person because they're racist. Um, definitely love your neighbors, whatever their, their viewpoints are. The goal is to change that mindset and change the system. And so when you're anti-racist, you're not allowing certain things to exist. So it's a more of an active um, phrase than just being passive. Like, oh, I, I don't hate anyone. Or it's more active. And so I have an example. Um, I was at an animal rights conference a couple of years ago, and it was a talk. Um, on intersectionality, um, and one of the speakers um, was uh, Latinx, and a gentleman stood up and asked, why were we talking about racism and any of those things? Um, we should only care about the animals. And it was really interesting that he asked that question during that talk, since the talk was about <laughs> like the intersectionality. But what was interesting is that the white women in the room stood up, no one else had to, to say anything and they addressed him and they addressed him with compassion, but they addressed him and they, you know, let him know um, why what he said was wrong. Cause he sat there, he thought it was okay and he didn't understand why. And so what those women did was anti-racist because they did not sit back and allow that statement to go unchecked. Then they, not only that, but none of the people of color in that room had to say a word. And so quite frankly, had I stood up and said something, he probably wouldn't have listened to me. But by the white women standing up and saying, okay, that was inappropriate, this is why, this is why these things are important, that was a very anti-racist thing that they did. And so it's a very active thing that, you know what I mean? So there's this different, because they could have said, oh, well, you know, and it's not that the guy necessarily had any hate or um, anything like that, but what he said was, would it be considered racist? And so definitely having that knowledge of intersectionality, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, is important. Then we have food colonialism. And so um, the lady who actually was just talking about, Dr. Linda Alvarez, was in the room. Um, she's one of the speakers. Um, and she quote, I'm gonna quote her, white people writing about new foods, discovered ingredients and recipes they've stumbled upon is a form of colonialism. And so she goes on um, a little more, um, make sure I quote her exactly. Um, she goes on to basically say what food colonialism is and she brings up how pervasive Western food in, in our culture, um, not just here, but all over the world. And so um, I was having this, this discussion with a friend and we're talking about food colonialism. And I loved his description of how, like when you think of colonialism, it's someone coming in and putting their culture and their food and everything into another system and like having their beliefs, their food, everything be dominant. And so we can think of that with food colonialism, you know, McDonald's in China <laughs> and, and different food sources and places um, even though um, I've, I've read that ch the Chinese government is working very hard to um, make sure people are eating a traditional diet, but colonialism is very pervasive throughout the world. A lot of people idolize um, what they see on television and what they um, perceive as um, a wealth of being able to eat certain food. And so we can talk about ways to um, end that, but one thing is um, money and not spending your money and at certain organizations um, and spending your money locally instead and supporting local businesses. So that's just um, one form of um, food colonialism. We also have food apartheid. And so we had questions about um, food deserts. And so food deserts are, um, it's a term that's very um, limited. It's used, um, the government uses it is to define areas that um, are usually low income and um, do not have easy access to food. And usually those areas are going to be um, of either Latinx or African American or, um, or native indigenous um, descent. And that's part of structural racism, why that is. And so food apartheid kind of looks at the whole um, system. So it looks at the whole food system, it takes into account the income, it looks at race and geography, 
and encompasses the social and racial inequities that are at play in our food system. And so um, when we say food desert, it's like we think of deserts as a natural place and it's nothing natural about the way our food system is designed. It's designed um, with purpose and purposefully. So we need to make sure that we um, think about those words a little differently. Um, oh, and also I just want to bring up food sovereignty because um, that's another um, term that's used a lot. And basically just making sure people not only have access to healthy food, but have a say in what food is available in their area. And so a lot of people go into an area with good intentions and um, give food or say here and be thankful and not think about or grow foods in areas that they're not familiar with and not think about what is a um, culturally appropriate food um, for that area. And so just food sovereignty allows people to have a say over what is in their own neighborhoods. Um, acknowledging that they have the knowledge and wisdom to know what they need and not necessarily need someone else to tell them what's best for them. And um, also making sure that there's equity in land. And so there's been a huge displacement since 1950s, um, over 14% of farmlands were owned by African-Americans and it was only 1%. And so we have to look at like all of that um, and food apartheid because when you have land, you have wealth and you have access. And when you don't have any of those things, um, you can become dependent. And um, that's for all of us actually, <laughs> um, not, not just um, black people, just everyone. Um, and so I do talk about growing your own food a lot. <laughs> but uh, yes, um, so just looking at the whole system, that's, that's a huge part of it. And I'll have some resources um, for those because I've got a decent amount of questions. So I just wanna make sure that I provide um, some great links for you to get more information on those topics because I think it's very important um, when talking about these topics. Thank you, Crystal. Um, so what is the interconnectedness of social justice movements and the food colonialism? So I, I got this uh, quote off of foodprint.org on food justice, because this is constantly what we're always talking about, especially uh, in our mission and when what drives us to do what we do. People of color are the most severely impacted, most severely impacted by hunger, and, and this is globally, uh, by hunger, poor food access, diet-related illness, and other problems with the food system. The food justice, justice movement works not only for access to healthy food for all, but also examines the structural roots of these disparities and works for racial and economic justice too. So to Crystal's point. So the work that we're doing or that anyone in the food justice movement is doing is not new work. And just to continue on uh, what Food Prince says, what's getting lost is the predominant narrative about urban white foodies obsessing over the latest food trend and statistics on poor health outcomes for minority groups is that people of color have been bringing historical injustices in the food system to light and have been working toward empowering alternatives. So, you know, I it, it always concerns me why people think this is something new. Um, and I think Tracy McWhorter does a really great job in this interview uh, with the Invisible Vegan. And if, if you haven't seen the Invisible Vegan documentary by Jasmine Leva, it is, a, it, it's just something to see because for some reason, black vegans, people of color vegans, it's like we're non-existent, but we've been in this movement and we've been eating this way for 400 years. It may not be everyone, but we're still here and we need to be represented. And she does a great job of talking about that in The Visible Vegan. Here's Tracy McWhorter to answer some of your questions. Now, this hasn't always been the case. Um, back in the 80s, in fact, in Washington, D.C., there was a place called uh, Brown Rice. Actually, the, the very first all vegan, 100% vegan establishments in the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. were started by African Americans in poor black neighborhoods. So this has not always been the case, right, that we have these food deserts now. Um, 
but that is the case now. And um, so I say that, I give that context because I want people to understand that this is not, that eating healthy food is something that's always been a stream that's been going on in uh, African American communities in our, in our society. Right along with us eating unhealthy food, there's been a large group of black folks, not as large as most, but there's always been a large group that's been eating healthy and plant-based, right? And so, just like the Black Panthers started, the breakfast programs that eventually the federal government um, implemented, we've always been conscious about healthy eating. Um, it's just not been the majority of us. So, but, you know, we've been influencing the majority. And so, um, we're in a situation where the food deserts exist, right? This food is not available in our communities, and when it is available, um, in nearby communities, it's, all, it's often too expensive, you know, um, for us to eat. And so that's a product of systematic, um, that's a product of systematic racism. And it's also a product of capitalism. Because what's happened is, and, and, and we have to talk about it in the same breath right, racism and capitalism when it comes to black folks and food and food justice. Because the federal government is in bed with the food industry. The purpose of the, the USDA is to promote um, food products in this country, right, is to, pr to promote agribusiness. And so what that means is that the federal government gives subsidies for um, big food to um, produce cheap food. Right, so that means that it's going to be cheaper for us to get box macaroni and cheese or white bread or hamburger mix. It's going to be more expensive, I mean, it's going to be cheaper to purchase that, right, than it is for, to buy fresh produce, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, whole grains, beans, and nuts from the bulk bed. And that's by design. There is no, um, there are no lobbyists for broccoli. There are no lobbyists for uh, cauliflower. There are no lobbyists for brown rice. There are no lobbyists for health food uh, items like there are lobbyists for big food industries, right? And so that's the, and so what that means that we're going to see more food advertising for these foods, for these um, junk foods on TV. 80% of the advertising is for junk food. Only 2% is for healthy food. And it also means that we're not going to see these foods in our communities. So that's my long answer, but that, but all of it is connected. So Tracy answered it exactly the way I would have answered it. So I definitely had to share that with you, um, with, with the viewers, because now, that, that, that's what's going on. Um, and, you know, I hope everyone is, is in agreement with that. Um, so what represents the vegan movement in African-American culture? So this again is taken from Tracy McWhorter's African-American Vegan Starter Guide. Um, here's a timeline. So the African-American food ways are rooted in plant-based diets of our ancestors. Uh, Bryant Terry, uh, you know, Afro-vegan, his book, he has two books out. Um, for thousands of years, traditional West and Central African diets were predominantly vegetarian centered around staple foods like millet, rice, peas, okra, hot peppers, and yams. Um, and this plant-rich culinary heritage has survived and thrived throughout 400 years of our sojourn in the United States. In that tradition, African Americans are pioneers in the plant-based food movement, pioneers in the plant-based food movement. So I, I you know, just want to make sure everybody understands that. So we're not invisible. We've been here. Uh, the timeline here uh, is from 1915 to 1999. So as you can see, the Seventh-day Adventists, you know, religious group, um, you know, they have this ad out um, about a health conference. Uh, 1958, uh, we have, you um, uh, I have to look at, at the, the guide because the, the, it's a little small there. But again, this is on page 32 and 33 of the African American Vegan Starter Guide. But health food stores open a vegetarian cafe and an herbal pharmacy on the south side of Chicago. 1965, who do we have here? Dick Gregory, like the biggest activist, also comedian, a most influential vegan act, act, um, activist in the country. 
uh, inspired many, came out with a book in 1974, um, Natural Diet for Folks Who Eat, Cooking with Mother Nature. Um, then you have Farewell to Chitterlings. I've never had Chitterlings. Uh, you know, I still to this day don't <laughs> see how people were eating Chitterlings because as soon as I heard intestine, I'm like, no way, that is not for me. But anyway, in 1974, you have Cicely Tyson, Taj Mahal, Earth, Wind and Fire, Andy Gregory uh, in an ad, Ebony Magazine featuring this article, Say Goodbye to Chitterlings, 1974. 1976, we have um, Soul to Soul, uh, a book that came out. I mean, uh, and it's a new vegetarian uh, cookbook. 1979, um, a live vegan food company in Harlem. Then in 1983, the first soul vegetarian restaurant is established in, in Chicago. 1982, Washington, D.C. opens the first all vegan cafes and health food stores in the nation's capital. 1982, Morehouse College uh, graduates, uh, opens, open delights of the Garden Raw vegan restaurants. Then you got 1993, Queen of Foo. I have her book here. Like this is, this is a classic. 1993, Heal Thyself. We just talked about health disparities. So her book comes out in 1993. 1995, um, we have, uh, uh, Fresh Corner Roar Vegan Restaurant in Chicago, another major city uh, with a uh, vegan restaurant. In 1997, Maya McWhorter and Tracy McWhorter, sisters, create blackvegetarians.com, the first website by and for African-Americans. Uh, and then in 1997, you got the Black Vegetarian Society of Georgia um, that definitely um, uh, honored uh, uh, by them because Black Vegetarian Society of Maryland is influenced by them. That's why we have a Black Vegetarian Society in Maryland. And then 1999, uh, we have Sacred Space Retreat in San Francisco, the first Black-owned vegan retreat center and substance use recovery facility in the country. So again, the African American Vegan Starter Guide uh, is the first guide for us by us published by uh, Tracy McCurder with the help of uh, Farm Sanctuary and it is free to download and we'll give you that link it's, it's in the presentation so just that question about the timeline and, and 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 there's more like this is not all inclusive of the timeline but this is major historical highlights. Now Fast forward to today, what is Black Vegetarian Society of Maryland doing to represent the vegan movement in African-American culture? Uh, the first thing we did is we launched a Keep It Fresh Fest <laughs> and we um, you know, scoured and, and found uh, people in different parts of the country to come up and, and give food demonstrations. And um, uh, in one of the largest parks in Baltimore, Drew Hill Park, uh, then we have Black vegans stepping out for their health and other causes. Vegan Soul Fest who was, was running for seven years. Um, another major attraction. People thought we couldn't do it, but we needed a vegan festival for us by us. And the, the festival as of 2018 attracted upwards of 16,000 people when we had Maya, who's also vegan, headline for us. So major, 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 and people are still looking uh, for this fest. But, you know, we got COVID going on. So we're just trying to figure out uh, how to navigate through that because this is the type of festival that we can't do it virtually. It is a community thing and it's about the food and it's about being able to uh, assess, uh, access the people that are doing the demos and doing the presentations. So, you know, it's really um, putting a damper on our planning that uh, COVID has impacted our ability to organize this festival uh, last year and we're not sure what's going to happen this year. Um, here, look, hip hop, the fastest growing vegan demographic is African Americans, Wu-Tang Clan and other hip hop acts paved the way. And think what you want about hip hop. Hip hop is just not the trap rap. That is one component of hip hop. There are 10 elements, thanks to Keith Tucker for introducing the 10th element being health and wellness. So now the hip hop community is embracing uh, the veganism. Uh, so, so that's significant because they have major influence. 
Um, Baltimore highlighted again in Civil Eats. Baltimore is at the vanguard of a national Black vegan movement. Crystal was highlighted in this article. Uh, Landa Kush was highlighted. Black Vegetarian Society was highlighted. And this was as of November 2019. Definitely a great read uh, uh, from Civil Eats. And then U.S. News, Black Americans ditch meat and stereotypes. Um, we're showing plant-based diet isn't just for white people and never was. But again, I don't know where this came from because historically we see that we've been doing this since the early 1900s. Um, here's what Black Vegetarian Society is doing. Outreach, dinners, festivals, cooking demos, um, free food, sampling, uh, look at the children, sampling plant-based milks. This is effective outreach for us because People that weren't even thinking about this lifestyle are, are thinking about it now. Why? Because they get to taste and they get the education from us. So this is this is work, this is the type of work that needs to be done in the community and, and, and it's effective and um, it uh, it's making an impact. Uh, here we go, Meatless Monday. You know, there's a lot of folks that are against Meatless Monday, but hey, everyone is not going vegan or plant-based the same way. It is that individual's journey, and this is an option. Meatless Monday, whether you're going to do it um, all day, after six, whatever is out there, we promote Meatless Monday as an option uh, to go vegan. And as you see, we have invited people out that's a... Uh, uh, Chef Etef from Denver and his wife Alchemia, who's a Reiki master, uh, they came out. He's an eco hip hop art, uh, artist and an organic gardener. So, definitely doing a lot of things in his community in Denver. Then we have Gangster Vegan. If you've heard of the Gangster Vegan uh, franchise, they, they had opened up a few um, organic uh, eateries. He's there showing us how to make a cashew type of. Um, uh, dish, and then you have Crystal Foreman, uh, same day in the morning, doing her demo uh, as well. So this this is how we're representing movement in the African American culture. And Crystal, you began at gardening. Yes. Yeah. So um, I do a lot with food, from growing it to. Um, you know, teaching people how to cook it. And one of the things with the veganic gardening is teaching people the difference between organic. So veganic gardening, um, for those who don't know, is basically organic gardening using um, vegan practices. So basically not using any animal products or byproducts. And so a lot of organic farming um, and gardening involves, like if you're using like store-bought um, fertilizers, it's either going to be chemical fertilizers or it's going to be fertilizers with um, phone, uh, fish, bone, or blood meal. And so um, it's coming from the animals. And so it's hard. A lot of the organic farms out there, even if they do um, buy a lot of the products that have the blood meal and bone meal, a lot of those um, animals were fed things that had pesticides. And so the pesticides actually bioaccumulates in their um, tissue and in their blood. And so it still gets into um, the soil. So veganic gardening allows you to have a more closed system. Um, it's actually less, can be less expensive than um, organic farming. Um, there are a lot of things that you can do to still get your nitrogen um, fixers um, into your soil um, using things like comfrey. It's very inexpensive um, to use as a green manure. So there are a lot of options out there. So here I am actually doing um, straw bale gardening, which is super inexpensive. So I was showing people how to do um, inexpensive gardening where you don't have to buy a lot of soil. You can get a bale for anywhere from four to eight dollars. And um, you can either leave it whole like I did or take them out um, and put them in different containers and grow really anything. I've known people to grow watermelon, corn on a cob, <laughs> like corn in them, um, like anything. Um, is you do have to treat it to make it so that you can grow. But it's also a great um, option for people who have a hard time lifting heavy things because the straw is so light. And so it makes um, gardening, especially container gardening, accessible financially and physically for most people. Um, you do have to, um, so in this um, video, I, was, I did a video for this. Um, I was showing people how to condition 
the bale so that you can actually grow in it. Um, it's great for growing carrots. A lot of people like to grow strawberries, um, which is a great food to grow yourself because of all the pesticides that are used on strawberries. Um, and organic strawberries are expensive. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's just something that, um, and it grows well in our, in our region, strawberries. But yeah, just showing people. So you can look at the videos um, online on YouTube um, for holistic dash wellness and health. Um, a holistic wellness and health um, on YouTube. And I have several other container gardening videos. So that's mostly what I've been focusing on so that, especially after the um, pandemic started, just showing people how they can do um, things at home, even if they have a small yard or just they have one bedroom apartment. So um, that's pretty much it for the vegan garden. Thing. Did you want to say anything about uh, what you were doing here in this video, Crystal? Yeah. Um, in this picture. I was doing, um, showing people how to make breakfast items, um, veganized breakfast items. I did um, blueberry pancakes, and um, I think I did the tofu scramble, and there's one other dish I did. So three different dishes that day, um, just showing people um, how easy it is. If you ever watch any of my cooking demos, you'll see how fast I am. <laughs> I don't play. And boy, is she fast. She does like 15 minutes. I'm like, wow, that's great. <laughs> And when I go out in public, I could show people how to do like three dishes in 45 minutes. And so you can have, you know, you don't have to be in the kitchen all day. And I would show them from prep to, you know, and when I do the videos, I don't want people to get bored seeing me chop carrots. So I have some of that already prepped. But um, yeah, it, it doesn't have to take a lot of time. Um, you don't have to be in the kitchen for two hours. And so I, I just want to show people how easy it is. And by being in person, they could taste it and see how delicious it is as well. Um, now, um, they just take my word for it and go in and do it. Um, but it is good. Um, and I, I try everything ahead of time to make sure and I test things with my parents. So um, <laughs> if they say it's really good, then I know um, it's good to go because they're so um, omnivore, but they're mostly plant-based. I can attest to that because I watched Crystal a couple of times do demos at the uh, plantation garden with the produce. So they have the fresh produce boxes that they give away. And she used everything in that box to make a meal. And I was like, I went home and did the same thing. I said, this is amazing. <laughs> it's very important, um, especially now. A lot of people really don't know how to cook fresh produce. And so making sure that they, um, if they're receiving it, that they know what to do with it so that they're eliminating food waste. Um, and also making sure people are getting the nutrients um, that they need, especially now, um, is very important that we're getting all of the vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients. And the best way to get that is in fresh produce. And I don't want people to be afraid to use the turnips and the rutabagas and all of the funny looking things that come in the boxes sometimes. Um, it's, it's fun. So yeah, um, and we have the next slide, uh, connection between um, climate justice, um, climate change, and food. And so if you look at this um, slide, you can see where um, our current path is. And if we make the changes that they suggest that we make in order to start decreasing um, the amount of carbons that are in, emitted so um, I'll just read this from um, the source. So this is from um, motherjones.com. So if you as consumers were to cut back their meat habit by about 40% as recommended by the World Health Organization um, to just under six ounces per person um, per day, they'll be doing their part in slashing the global food related emissions by nearly a third. And so that's a huge, um, huge percentage. And a move to a flexitarian diet, which would be 1.5 ounces of meat a day or about three hamburgers a week, would help reduce um, the world or cut that world emissions by 52%. Mm. So that would give climate um, you know, a chance to basically bounce back. So flexitarian um, for people who are like, oh, I, I just need to still have fish or whatever that is, um, is definitely shown to at least to that point, make a huge difference in the amount of CO2 that's released um, in, in our atmosphere, um, which causes the, the global warming um, and climate change. And so the UN experts have actually um, said switching to a plant-based diet can help fight climate change 
um, in general. You can go to the next slide. And um, they said more people could be fed using less land if we were to cut down on consumption of meat. And so um, there's a document by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, you can find that um, document online. And it says that um, if land were used more effectively, it could store more carbon emitted by humans. And so if you think about like what stores um, the, car the CO2, we have our soil, which is a huge um, source for holding our carbon in our plants. And also um, our plankton in the ocean. And so actually the plankton the ocean is our, the world's largest um, absorber of the CO2. And then we have um, our soil. And so like the rivers um, transport the carbon into our waterways from our rocks and soil. So it's important that we are making sure that um, when we are have plants in the ground, first of all, it helps to, to keep that CO2 in the ground. And then um, the type of farming practices that we use and um, like within the trees as well, the, the practices we use can like with tilling actually release a lot of that carbon. And so we have to think about using just different practices that are more sustainable um, for the environment and for, for the soil, which um, good soil gives us good food and healthy food. So that all of that is important for us. And so we can look at um, things like agroforestry um, is becoming more prevalent and um, using practices where we are still growing food um, in a nutritious manner that's um, equitable for all people. And so when we also look at climate justice, we have to think about the impact that um, growing food has on certain areas. And so like in North Carolina and South Carolina, a lot of, um, there's a lot of environmental um, racism going on with a lot of the farms because of the chemicals and um, the way the animals, the, the sewage and their, their waste they actually spray it in the air. And so it's poor air quality to people down there, just about everyone has asthma and health issues because of the quality of the air. And a lot of times the farmers are spraying, um, you know, when people, you can't go outside your house. They've done testing inside people's homes, um, like swiping their refrigerators. And even if they try to keep everything sealed off, they're still finding fecal matter um, from pigs and cows in people's homes. Um, and so it's very um, disheartening. What, so it's not just like what they're doing to the animals, it's what they're doing to the people who live in those areas and to workers who actually work at those locations. Um, but the climate um, justice part also looks at, like right now the um, equator is heating up at a higher rate and they're losing um, certain foods for, from being able to grow there is too hot. And so they're losing um, food species, they're losing plants. And um, some areas are going to become more arid and harder to grow food. And that's going to lead um, to a decrease in food in certain areas, which will of course lead to other issues. So um, climate justice and climate change and food, all of that goes together when we decide um, what we're gonna spend our money on. Um, you know, when consuming food, whether it's local or um, food from, you know, halfway around the world and thinking about, um, you know, how much of something you're consuming, all of that makes a difference in our climate change. And so I definitely love to promote, you know, eating lo as local as possible um, and using um, food that's not damaging or is at, at least as least damaging as possible um, to our environment. Um, Thank you, Crystal. You're welcome. So how does one adopt a plant-based diet? So you, you heard my story. I had to find out about my cholesterol to even think about adopting a, a diet, which is plant-based now, <laughs> vegan. Um, I started with uh, knowing someone. So I knew my husband uh, and he exposed me to a lot of things. Um, people start their journey a number of different ways. They either looked at a documentary, um, they looked at a veg guy, uh, they went to a meetup, they attended a workshop, or like my husband, he did it himself. He just took everything out of the refrigerator, bought himself a cookbook and decided to learn how to cook. And he didn't know how to cook at all. He's self-educated at this point. Um, 
What I did was a transition. So I didn't transition overnight. My, my transition took three years. Why? I was a big seafood lover, um, you know, all types of seafood products and cheese was the hardest thing as well. But uh, Mothers Against Dairy <laughs> reached out to me and wanted to get my take on the dairy industry as a mother and how I felt after all the research that I did about dairy. And once I found out everything that was going on in the dairy industry, I had to make this statement about if I would have known this years ago, living in the housing uh, city project, I probably wouldn't be consuming milk. <laughs> But, um, you know, what are we to do? Uh, we're, we're poor. Uh, we don't have access to a lot of fresh foods. Uh, right now, to this day, my mother has a nice um, food market across the street from her building. Like if that was there years ago, it would have been amazing for us. But we didn't have all of these great supermarkets where you can get fresh produce. All of our stuff was boxed, just like Tracy McCurdy said, box this, box that, can this, can that. Um, so what do you like? I mean, if you're not vegan, if you're not fully plant-based, there, there are items that you consume for breakfast, lunch, dinner. What can you do with those items to veganize them? So I was a big scrambled egg person. Okay, now I got to play around with scrambled tofu, you know, season it, put the vegetables in it, you know, play with the vegan cheeses to find out what's, what's good for me. What am I eating for lunch? Okay, I can have a soup and a sandwich. How can that be veganized? A vegan chili. Um, a uh, we make a carrot tuna here at the at the Land of Kush. Uh, I can have that on a sandwich for dinner. Hey, if it's spaghetti or lasagna, we can veganize that by putting vegetables in it. I I, I usually ask people think about what you eat on a daily pay basis for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and choose one of those things and see if you can veganize it. That's how you can go that route if you're not going to do the overnight thing because you watched a documentary or went to a meetup or something like that. Um, this, this journey is personal per individual. Food is social. Food is social, is cultural, and you have to understand that just because somebody saw a, a documentary about animals being killed. I live in Baltimore City. People see people getting killed every day. So <laughs> it's like, okay, and... So we have to customize, it's all marketing. We have to customize our strategy for different individuals and different demographics. It's all marketing. So how do you gain the buy-in? Um, there's lots of things for everyone. Crystal has a, a gift here, holistic-wellnessandhealth.com gifts. That is a way you can go to uh, adopt uh, a plant-based diet. So it has to be what's, what's best for you, because it's not one cookie cutter thing for everyone. Um, so I can only tell you my story on how I adopted a plant-based diet. It was a three-year transition and I just removed things uh, bit by bit until I fully became vegan and was satisfied with uh, the results of becoming vegan. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, so what is good food? Herbs and spices and so when making um, any change um, to your diet, one of the most important things um, is flavor and texture. And you can control your flavor with your herbs and spices, um, as well as um, oils that you use if you choose to use oil um, and other seasoning. So the most essential herbs and spices are onion powder, um, garlic powder, um, Sea salt or like a pink Himalayan salt. If you use salt, if you don't use salt, um, you can use onion powder and garlic powder to season a lot of your food and get that um, same taste. Pepper, cinnamon, nutmeg, ginger. So if you have nothing else, you like, I can't, you know, I'm starting fresh. I've never cooked before. I have no spices in my cupboard. You know, you just need to start from someplace. Those are the most basic. You can do a lot with those um, spices, the cinnamon, nutmeg, great in oatmeal. Um, you can make pies and desserts with that. Um, salt and pepper is super basic, um, but it'll get you through. Um, and then adding, if you like onion and garlic powder, I think that's a great way to go. If you're looking for something more spicy, depending on the, like your taste buds, adding cayenne, um, cayenne pepper, chili powder um, is great for like um, doing chili or doing, uh, yeah, chili or anything like that, um, Southwestern type dishes. 
curry, um, red pepper flakes I love to use and um, like black pepper for the spice as well. Um, then if you're getting a little fancier, like certain types of like curries or Indian um, dishes, you can use turmeric, cumin, and I love smoked paprika. And Ooh. so um, if you're <laughs> someone who, um, like I make a great um, greens using smoked paprika. So for a lot of people, I grew up with grandmothers that put smoked meats in the greens. And so it wasn't that I didn't like the flavor. I just didn't like the meat in it. I was always picking it out. But um, now I've learned to still get that same flavor that I'm familiar with, that I grew up with, without having the cholesterol added and um, is absolutely delicious. So you can use smoked paprika. Liquid smoke is extremely ex inexpensive. You can find it near the barbecue. Um, sauce is usually on the top shelf. Um, where no one looks, <laughs> no matter what grocery store you go to, it always seems to be on the top shelf. So um, liquid smoke is a great one to add. I like Italian food. And so if you um, just get Italian seasoning, that can flavor up pretty much anything. Um, your tofu scramble, your soup, um, your salad, dressing, whatever you want, Italian seasoning. Or you can break that down and get the um, basil, parsley, rosemary, thyme, oregano, and um, just, I love putting just basil in things, fresh basil or um, dried. Basil is really easy to grow during the summertime in this region, so um, that's a good one um, to have fresh. Nutritional yeast is something I like to um, use as well for its nutty, cheesy flavor, and it's very high in B12, and so um, a lot of people worry about vegetarians and vegans having low B12, but actually as a nation, our B12 levels are extremely low. Uh, we usually get our B12s from the soil. And so we don't, um, when we pick our carrots, we wash it. So we wash everything and we're taking the B12 off. And our and the animals, for people who do eat animals, their B12s are low as well because they're not being, they're not grazing. They're not outside um, and getting that natural soil bacteria that actually has the B12. And so some places are starting to um, give animals B12 um, supplements, but you can do that yourself um, with B12 supplements. You don't have to get that through another source. Um, and like I said, nutritional yeast is a great way to get that B12 and spirulina as well. But nutritional yeast is great on popcorn and, and anything savory, <laughs> anything yes. soup. Um, really anything. I, I, I make my own cheeses. Um, cheese using nut, um, nuts and seeds, and I use nutritional yeast um, to give it that nice um, cheesy flavor. Um, and then this is outside of the herbs and spices, but it's great to have vanilla extract. Um, Bragg's amino acids can make even the blandest stuff taste good. Um, tamari is basically soy sauce without the wheat, but you could do soy sauce as well. Apple cider vinegar, so people who don't want to use a lot of salt, um, onion powder, garlic powder, and apple cider vinegar together make a great um, substitute for salt in most of your dishes. So if you don't want to use, um, if you're on low sodium, apple cider vinegar is a great um, substitute. And I love to cook with sesame oil and peanut oil. Um, that just takes your food to a whole nother level. <laughs> so, um, but for super essential, super basics, just if you get your salt, pepper, cinnamon, garlic powder, onion powder, you're good to go. Oh my goodness, I'm hungry, Crystal. Uh, we're gonna be wrapping it up soon. You know, after all of this food talk, I'm very hungry. <laughs> Ensuring our ability to elect our representative government. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, testify in Annapolis on a bill to uh, get more uh, plant-based options in hospitals and prisons. So, I mean, that's that's one way uh, I I can I go about ensuring our ability to elect representative government. I mean, uh, this this was a hard one, actually, uh, Crystal and I were talking about. I mean, something else happened this uh, last year with the PCRM, Physicians Committee of Responsible Medicine. They sent a letter to the U.S. Department of Agriculture and got a collective group of uh, organizations to endorse the letter. So Black Vegetarian Society, of course, was one. Landa Kush was another. Uh, and um, uh, Willie, Willie Flowers um, 
approved the endorsement for the NAACP Maryland State Conference. So, I mean, that that is one of the way, I don't know if, if I'm answering the question, but we just have to uh, be active with our government officials, uh, you know, whether it's phone calls, letters, testifying, and, you know, just letting people know that we need these, these options. I mean, you know, doing Maryland Vegan Restaurant Week to tell <laughs> restaurants that we need more plant-based options on the menu, you know, th just, just things like that. Um, working with the Baltimore uh, City uh, Health Committee and, you know, informing them like, hey, you know, uh, we need to do a Meatless Monday, like what they're doing in New York, things like that. Um, so I think those were some of the ideas that I, I wanted to share. And if that doesn't answer the question, we can definitely uh, talk about it more after the presentation. Chris, do you have anything to add? Um, no, not for this one. Okay. Um, farmers can thrive on their land using without using animals. Um, I'm a contributor for Jane Unchained News. Uh, she's based out of um, California, and they're coming up with a second uh, edition of their Rap Live Summit uh, that kind of answers this question. I know Crystal attended the first one. I didn't have an opportunity to to attend, so she can tell you more about that. But this one is going to be talking about the how to's to do that. What can farmers do on their land to thrive without using animals? And this is a free summit. Um, all you have to do is uh, register. Uh, the uh, website address is rancheradvocacy.org for flash summit. And that's uh, on February 6th. So you can find out more information about that. But Crystal, if you want to share anything, any additional information. Yeah, so you can watch the first one that was on November 21st. Um, it's, if you go to that website, you'll see a link and you can watch the um, first one. I recommend watching that just to get an idea of what's happening um, in the farming movement and get an idea of why people um, like ranchers are changing over and um, making the choice to use um, more sustainable and um, compassionate farming practices. Um, and it's definitely um, a great viewing. It's about two and a half hours, so just put some time out, or you can watch it in segments, but it's um, worth watching. And then, um, like Naja just said, the one on in February is going to be more about the how to actually um, make the changes. Um, then there's also um, the Earth Activist Training has a regenerative land management training program. I um, received my second um, permaculture design certificate from them. They're um, based in California, but everything's online right now. So this is a great opportunity to um, not have to necessarily travel um, to California. Sometimes they do things in Canada, but um, get that knowledge. It's a two-year program, the regenerative land management. It's not a vegan program, but it um, has a great information for people who want to learn how to start using um, their land in a different manner um, that's more environmentally friendly. Um, then you have the Veganic Agriculture Network. They promote plant-based farming and gardening throughout North America. And so um, it's goveganic.net. I'll make sure the link is in the, um, in the chat at the end. That's a great resource um, if you're interested in learning how you can start transitioning um, from an animal-based farm to um, having a farm that uses no animals at all. And then the UK actually has um, a couple of great networks um, that I think the resources are still beneficial on the Vegan Organic Network and StockFreeOrganic.net. Both have um, great resources for farms interested in using organic practices and veganic practices. And then um, I'll post our links to Go Vegan World has a great um, post on using, um, changing over your farm as well. So if anyone has um, any more questions about that, they can definitely reach out as well. But I'll make sure the links are there um, so that you can learn that it is possible to definitely have a thriving farm, um, a financially stable farm without using animals, because that's very important. A lot of people are concerned about like how to make that transition and do it in an economical way, because that's real. So just um, knowing that there are resources out there to assist you and um, knowledge out there as well. Right. Also just looking at, um, yeah, the, the veganic agriculture, the regenerative agriculture, if you can't necessarily do the, um, the, without the animals right away. 
campuses. Thanks, Crystal. Um, okay, so effective outreach. Um, again, our festivals, um, you know, <laughs> we're still thinking about what we're going to do about Vegan Soul Fest this year, but Keep It Fresh Fest, we are going to take it online. It will be a virtual fest, so we are planning that for June. June is National uh, Fresh Fruits and Vegetable Month, so we're working on that. Um, and we're planning for uh, some ideas for Musical Meatless Monday, which was a musical dinner that we had uh, in the month of May. Uh, and we were planning to do March and May, uh, but because of COVID, we, we couldn't do that last year. So we're planning for that. Maryland Vegan Restaurant Week is next week. I mean, next month. Uh, so uh, that is definitely our business to business approach, getting uh, restaurants to add more plant-based options on their menu and for people to take their fam families out and to try some different and good foods. Webinars and workshops, um, table sampling once we can get back to that, cooking demos online right now, and social media campaigns, whether they're veg pledges um, or drop your dump the dairy type of pledge. Uh, so this is a this has been working for us. Um, uh, my digital um, interviewing platform where I've been meeting tons of of activists, uh, whether they're vegan, plant based, uh, empowerment type activists. Uh, I'll continue to do that throughout throughout the year um, because it's definitely uh, helping me make connections and helping uh, Black Vegetarian Society make connections as well and uh, future collaborations. Um, so that's where we're at about uh, what is effective uh, outreach for Black Vegetarian Society in Maryland. And you can always contact us just like uh, Margaret did. So thank you, uh, blackvegofmd at gmail.com. Our website is bbsmd.org. Um, it's, it's constantly being updated. Um, if you have any other recommendations on what you would like to see on there, please submit them. And um, that's, that's where we are, our number, address, and on social media everywhere, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, you can follow us at Black Veg of MD. And I know I said we had a lot to talk about, and we did. So um, we were uh, open to take your questions. Uh, I'm Trinette Anache. I am a woman of color, an African-American woman. Um, I am a member of the Working Group on Racism, as well as the Change Group at Sandy Spring Monthly Meeting, the Quakers there. 49 years ago, when I was 26 years old, I became a vegan after reading Dick Gregory's book, Cooking with Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. I have never looked back. I am so impressed with our speakers tonight. Um, Thank it you. It is unbelievable to me. And uh, Betty? I too, you, you covered all of our 14 questions that were handed, that were sent in in advance. <laughs> you covered so much information. Oh my God, thank you so much. I'm so impressed. Um, let's, we have only a few minutes before we- um, And our, our apologies, we definitely wanted to address all the questions, you know, <laughs> I think that was the intent. <laughs> so we did take up a lot of time, but I knew it was worth it. We, we knew it was worth it. <laughs> Definitely, you, you addressed them up front. Let me just kind of combine a couple of comments and questions from the chat. Um, and then, um, yeah, the first one is about the stereotype diet of most African, um, uh, of Southern black people you see in the chat. Um, does this fall under food colonialism? And, and I was <laughs> thinking about um, the way we are, you said food is personal, food is emotional, the, the choices that we make. And they're also very traditional. They come from our family, from our backgrounds, from our upbringings. And, and that's sometimes some hard, some hard things, uh, ha patterns and habits to change. It, it is. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll go first and then Crystal, you can go. Um, I know my husband family is traditional. So you're talking about uh, traditionally it, it, it engulfed in traditional Thanksgiving values with the turkey and the ham and all of that. And for, for him to even introduce his family to collard greens and yams, collard greens and yams are vegan, you know, so um, they haven't come fully around, but the fact that they're open to let's bring some collard greens over there. Let's bring some yams. I mean, this is all vegan, but again, it is cultural. Uh, and, you know, from slavery, slaves, 
ate what they were given and they made the, the, the mess, the, the best of it. And it, it was creative. And, you know, that was that time, but uh, we have evolved. We know better, you know, better, you do better. But yes, that is the thing. People, family and culture. And the fact that this is what I was brought up on and I don't want to disrupt that. I don't want to change. Crystal, what do you have to say about it? Yeah. So um, definitely the stereotype is um, very prevalent. It's, real um, and it is something that is changing. Um, I think that a lot more people are, the, first of all, with all of the fake meats that are out there and all, <laughs> the options, it's a lot easier even like being it's easier than past four years <laughs> um, for most people to start transitioning and at least trying things that might not be 100% plant-based but it's, um, you know, it's getting away from at least the, the cholesterol, high cholesterol foods and away from the animals and the dairy. And so um, it has less environmental impact and, and of course less impact on the animals. Um, I think that when we think about um, changing, like he, I think the question brought up food to colonialism as well. Yes, um, that, that would fall under there as well, like that people had to eat what was available um, with the dominant culture or some, I'm sorry, were you gonna say something? Well, and this is just a follow-up question. I'm gonna take the two toward the end. Um, what about the emissions impact on those kinds of, of food industries that uh, are pork and, and poultry and, and eggs? Uh, how is that connected to planetary health? Yes, um, the pork industry is very um, harmful to our environment. It's harmful to our waterways. A lot of the, um, the waste, the blood and the, um, feces goes straight into our waterways and it causes a lot of environmental damage. It damages um, the fish as well. Especially with the floodings, and especially the with the floodings. And it goes you know. people's homes. Yeah, the flooding as well. And it goes literally down the street. Um, and so it goes all over. It's not contained, especially when there's big storms like we've had in the past few years, hurricanes coming through and transporting all of that all over the place. And so it has a huge impact. The poultry industry, a lot of people um, think that's a little less harmful, but it actually isn't. Um, our country eats a lot of chicken. Um, a lot of people think chicken is healthier and it's um, more humane than some of the other um, options out there. And so um, all of it is very damaging. Yeah, it's, it's hard to, to say one is better than the other because they're all pretty damaging, especially the pork industry is up there with the beef. Jeanette, you wanna keep? Uh, yes, one of the questions that was asked is what about the fake meat? Mm -hmm. I, I would say, uh, and from a restaurant standpoint, because we have a restaurant and we do um, uh, make a lot of the, the mock meats, it's a pro process is process is process. I wouldn't over consume processed food because you got to look at the, the sodium and things like that. But for transitionary vegans, vegans that some, I mean, for transitionary folks that are looking at veganism and maybe haven't even tried a vegetable. There's some people I can't even believe to this day, they, they just don't eat vegetables. They've been eating meat and starch all of their lives that, you know, we introduce them to a platter. Okay, have your, have your barbecue vegan ribs and your greens or a salad and rice or something like that. Like that is a transition um, and, and, and making things that they're familiar with assist us. So we have tons of customers that come in here that don't identify as vegan or vegetarian. They're coming in because the food is helping them with their health. We have testimonies where people have gone to their doctors and their cholesterol has gone down, their diabetes is like, it's just amazing. So if that's what's getting them there, then one step at a time. But I wouldn't over consume it. And we tell them that this is not something you want to eat every day, not impossible burger every day, not beyond burger every day. You know, it's in moderation. Get more plants on your plate, more vegetables on your plate. That's the goal. So we have a whole lot of questions and a, whole, and a very little time. So I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of a wrap up here by explaining again, what is pure vegetarian, plant-based no. and vegan? <laughs> Kind of be, help us to clarify those words. And then there's some other questions in the chat that we might uh, might want to take, like what are some better ways to replace manure for gardening? Uh, how, do I have to give up, how can I give up skim milk? Uh, what other outreach will you do post COVID? If you could just kind of wrap those 
both up, maybe both of you give a closing statement, then I'm going to pass it back to um, our yes. host. Yeah, I'm going to say pure vegetarian is now the plant based because again, somebody has to answer my question. How did vegetarian include eggs and dairy? I, I, I don't know. I mean, there was a term lacto, ovo, and then vegetarian, lacto, vegetarian, all of it. When Landa Kush opened up, we were vegetarian cuisine, which was pure vegetarian, no eggs, no dairy. Uh, I think this capitalism, this market took that added all the cheese and eggs, and now, hey, here you go with your vegetarian meal. That's my opinion on it. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's as best I could wrap it up. Um, Post-COVID, yes, there are plans to outreach. I think that's my cousin, Selena, so I'll answer that for her. Yes, there are plans to outreach community centers and schools to educate youth on plant-based options. That is what we do, and that's what we're going to continue to do. Crystal, do you want to add something? Yeah, um, I think that it is important to know the difference because I've had people um, provide me with what they thought was vegan food. Um, <laughs> like it had honey in it or something like that. So vegan is not just food, it's a lifestyle. And it's about not wearing animal products, not using animal products on my hair and my skin um, and not eating it as well. Whereas being um, nest, like plant-based or 100% um, pure vegetarian, like what my cousin is in New York, she has a leather purse, she wears a leather shoes, but she will not eat any animal products um, or animal byproducts. And so she's not vegan. She's very clear that she's not vegan. She does, she eats for her health. And so the, the um, animal part doesn't come into her, her point, but um, veganism is more of an ethical. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I wanna stop there because I know we're short on time and I just provided some resources in the chat. Thank you. We're, we're welcome to to answer these via email. If people want to share if you want to co get the get them together, and we can you know respond to them in a the blog or something like that. Margaret, what do you think? Can we let Pat Shanka or Ted Riley have one question for we, before we has, hand it back to you for our closing silence? I have a feeling she's going to have a good one. Go for it, Pat. Yes, please. My question was about milk because I'm a milk drinker and I need the calcium. And I, my, my impression is that it takes a whole lot of those green vegetables to make up for one cup, cup of milk. So I wanted to hear what you say. Yeah, so you can um, put some greens. Um, so spinach and kale are very high in calcium and um, just like two cups of, well, one cup of kale is, got how much percentage, but it's a decent percentage of calcium. The calcium we absorb is actually better absorbed from our, our um, plants than from dairy. And dairy is also very acidic. They've done some studies on nurses and shown that consuming a lot of dairy, like when you eat acidic food, it makes your body have to um, become, you know, back in balance. And one of the ways it does that is to take calcium from your bones. So when you have a very acidic diet, um, it can actually take calcium away from your bones. And so they've done studies on people who eat a lot of dairy and their bone, they actually had osteoporosis because of the high dairy intake. That was the only difference hmm. between them and others. And so you can definitely, um, a lot of the plant-based milks are fortified with vitamin D, just like animal milks are um, fortified. They're not, unfortunately don't have the right amount of vitamin D they would have in the past because the animals aren't getting the sun. And so they have to fortify the animals and fortify our milk. So we can just go in and, and do the same thing and um, take supplements or um, consume the food that's been fortified. So even a lot of the vegan cheeses have been fortified now with B12 and with um, vitamin D. Um, some orange juice um, have it as well. So there are different ways and better ways mm -hmm. for um, vitamin D um, that will actually help support your whole system. And, and to add to that, I would get rid of the uh, the dairy and the cheese before anything, to be honest with you. Those are the real killers. They're very um, inflammatory, extremely inflammatory. Thank you. 